Welcome to the Proteus Performance Podcast, where we feature our customers, their businesses, who they train, and how they train them. I'm your host, Will Waterman, Head of Human Performance and Sports Science at Proteus Motion. We are going to go into the science behind training, how to apply Proteus's patented 3D resistance technology to increase human performance, drive business, and improve health. And we have a really great guest as our guest today. His name is Bill Miller. Bill is a trainer based out of Chicago who works primarily with baseball and other rotational athletes. He works both in strength and conditioning and sports specific training with these athletes. With rotational power development being his passion, he's actually written two books, Throw Fast and Swing Fast. And he works with athletes ranging from youth athletes all the way up through the major leagues. I had a great conversation with Bill. He went really deep into his programming how he structures it with his athletes, when he uses his Proteus, how he uses it to gamify the training experience, using it for monitoring you know, readiness to train and using it to build a competition environment in his facility. He's seen, uh, even goes into a little bit on how he's using Proteus to monetize and uh, increase different revenue streams for his business and help him to diversify and thrive with a business so he's not just reliant on just his local athletes. So it's a great conversation. Bill's a really smart guy who went through, like a lot of us, had some training experiences younger in life that uh, didn't end up uh, having the results that he wanted, but he turned that into a passion to help others improve. And it was a really great conversation. I hope you enjoy it. Bill Miller, welcome to the show. Hell yeah. Thank you for having me on, man. Yeah, no problem. You know, uh, you were honestly short list of one of the first people we wanted to talk with. Uh, you know, I, ever since I met you, your, your passion for this is just, you know, I, I felt it even from afar, you know, uh, you know, being someone that uh, is, you know, working with all these rotational athletes all the time, see someone who puts it all together like you is really something special. So I'm excited for this conversation, excited for people to learn, uh, learn from you, but also kind of learn kind of how your, you know, your business operates, kind of what you do. So um, let's just start with this. I always like to start with this with our guests is tell us a little bit about your background. What, what got you into this field? Yeah. So I played baseball and a couple other sports. I played football and baseball primarily growing up. And I was probably like always the, the stronger kid that wasn't very fast. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I think we've all seen that, that kid on the team, like the four hole hitter that can hit for some power, but can't really run and stuff like that. So I, I especially liked weightlifting as I grew up. I, I definitely got that from like the football side. I was like lifting with my older brothers and stuff like that. And so I, I kind of grew to, want to go down this path of training just because it's what I like to do, you know, coming up through high school and college. And then I tried to do the professional baseball route. I signed a few contracts, but nothing big, just like independent ball. But with my baseball career, I didn't get very far in professional baseball. I actually wound up getting traded to a team and independent baseball is crazy like this, like teams yeah. are, you know, cut all the time. But yeah. I, I wound up getting traded to a team that stopped existing, basically. Like, <laughs> they're supposed to have a season, and then they said, no, we don't have the funding. So I got traded to a team oh, that didn't exist, and that's uh, how my season ended there. And I signed one more contract just for spring training. I got cut out of spring training. But so what I remember reflecting on, I was maybe like 24-ish years old, 23, 24 at the time. And I'm like, what? was it about like I trained all the time I trained probably five six times a week going crazy and all, all that stuff in the weight room but like what why is it that these other guys are so much better than me are they just genetically gifted are they just have they always been better than me and I just could never catch up like what's the difference maker and you're and so that's and just so the listeners who aren't watching this know Bill is a yoked dude like you are <laughs> a thick like muscular man so like I think it's one of those things where this is a great conversation to have because, you know, I bet you succeeded. You were probably pretty good in the weight room, right? Like I imagine oh, yeah. you were probably a lot better than a lot of the other guys 
Oh, yeah. We're maybe outperforming you for you know, maybe in these other aspects, but mm -hmm. you're a great example of someone who probably even gravitated towards weight training, right? Because you yeah. were pretty good at it. Yeah. Like, like I remember um, we did this like combine thing um, back when I was playing and it was like the winter before my last season of indie ball. And our combine was like bench press, deadlift, squat, that type of crap. Mm. And uh, I remember I squatted 500, I benched 330 and like some other like really great stuff for a baseball player. Those are extremely good numbers at oh. 225 pounds. You know, that's about as big and strong as you will probably see on a baseball field. Right. And but then when you look at my actual like performance, I had maybe an 86, 87 mile per arm exit velocity probably peaked at a hundred. It wasn't like amazing. I didn't hit a lot of home runs and stuff. So it's just like, and I was not a fast runner. So it's just like, huh, he's big and strong, but he's really not producing the way that you would expect him to out in the baseball field. So that's kind of always been the driving force for me as a coach is like, what is the missing component? Why was I missing that component? And what are the things that I need to make sure that I do when I'm training athletes? And so when I was playing indie ball, I had a facility that I trained out of and I just kind of took over the strength training role at that facility because I'd been there for so long. And so I'm training mostly travel ball teams and I started training some of my own personal clients from those travel teams. And then from there, it just kind of grew. That facility wound up going under uh, post COVID. And then I went to another facility, kind of the same thing, but I started to get more of my own clients. And, um, but like over the years, what I really started to notice with these travel ball organizations was that, okay, these teams come in maybe once a week for training and these kids are paying tons of money for this. And it's just like one training session a week. It's just kind of crappy. They're not really making progress. So when I had my own personal clients, I'm like, okay, I know I'm in control of them. The number one thing that I want to make sure that we do is that we actually measure stuff so that we are improving these kids. These are like my guys. These are like my family. You know what I mean? I want to make mm -hmm. sure they improve. So rather than just the regular old travel ball scam of take the money, you do some lunges and then you go home and maybe you got better. Maybe you didn't. I wanted to measure and make sure that kids actually got better. So we measured sprint times. And so we started measuring medicine ball throw velocity Mm. And that was a big thing. Like not a lot of other people were with doing a radar that. gun. Yeah. With a radar gun. And we would do it for distance as well. If the weather was nice outside or whatever, but yeah, that was kind of our big thing because I never really thought or learned it from anybody else. I was just like, okay, let's try to measure this. Let's try to measure that. And it started reading good. And the first thing I noticed was all these guys that are throwing the light medicine balls really fast for the most part, all through a baseball really fast too. Hmm. What's the component there? It's that, that high speed, that explosiveness. That's something that all these great throwers seem to have. And so now you start to create more and more correlations and things like that. Like, okay, these guys are good at this one and they're good at exit velocity. These guys are good at this one. They're good at throwing velocity. And mm. that's kind of what the driving force was for swing fast. The first book that I wrote was just, I've been tracking these numbers for a couple years now. And I'm starting to see some things, you know, the wheels are starting to turn. Yeah. And so that kind of leads me up to when we first talked about the Proteus and it took a while, probably like six to eight months before I really like jumped in and, and got the Proteus um, one, because that facility that I was at wound up closing down. Mm. And so, and then I moved into the new place that mm -hmm. like basically I'll had the room to take on a Proteus. But what it also was, was, at the time I was tracking medicine ball throw velocity a lot and I was seeing some good things, but what the Proteus could offer with the acceleration scores, the versatility of like loading and, and, you know, deloading movements, higher, lower weights, whatever you wanted, different ranges of motion and different movement patterns that you could test in any range of motion. That was what the missing component really wound up being. So that's why I was, I had been measuring stuff for a while and the Proteus really wound up being like the ultimate tester, the ultimate measure of performance. And so that's kind of how we got here, I guess. Today. Yeah, no, that, that, that's awesome to hear. And, I, you know, you're not the first person to kind of equate uh, or replace or like somewhat, you know, substitute med ball testing with Proteus testing, you know, because I think it's one of those things where 
you know, now that this tool exists, which hasn't existed before, um, before you were limited to what, uh, you know, tools you had available. So you could throw a med ball, different loads and track it with a radar gun or measure distance. But as you know, that can be a little, you know, annoying to like track all those things, write them all down, or you just walk over to Proteus, you do the same movements, it stores it for you. And by the way, it's actually loading it in the plane of movement, which is, you know, something, you know, I know Eric Cressy uh, talked about something he really liked about Proteus early on is we're actually loading it in the direction and plane of movement of the action, which what a better way to do it than with a, a med ball, you know, it's coming from the down direction. So you have this, uh, uh, you know, another way to actually gather information and if they're actually, you know, uh, exploding and moving powerfully in the rotational plane and not, you know, having to overcome this downward force of just gravity, which, you know, baseball is a completely, almost completely frontal plane and transverse plane, you know, sport. Yeah, yeah, so, exactly. Um, so, yeah, no, I, I, I love it. So now tell us a little bit about your business itself. Like, you know, I know you focus on youth athletes, but also you were with professional athletes. Like, how do you, how do you target these uh, individuals? Are you, are you uh, going to like high schools and talking to them? Is it all word of mouth? Tell us a little bit about that aspect. of it. Yeah. So I guess the big thing for me, and I kind of touched on this before, but I've always wanted to be sort of the antithesis to like travel ball training. Like I, I can't express enough how much I hate the travel ball style of here. You're going to pay thousands of dollars. You're going to come in to train maybe once, maybe twice a week. We mm. don't really care if you develop, you're going to show mm. up, you're going to play your games and you're going to you know, rinse and repeat. And if you leave, who cares? We're going to get somebody else. And that's kind of that, that expense of, of, of like of training like they are paying you money and mm. they're getting crap like they're paying for filet mignon and they're getting you know mcdonald's burgers <laughs> and 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 i've always hated that like at the core of me i think it's such a scam mm. and i've really always wanted to say okay whatever athletes i do train whether it's 10 kids 15 20 whatever right now i'm at about 20 I want them all to make vast improvements from when they start. Like I want them to get their money's worth. So that's like from a business perspective, that's like my biggest thing is mm -hmm. I, I, I want to like, I, I don't care to ever turn the travel ball organizations on their heads. I'm never going to do that. Mm -hmm. But I do want to show that, Hey, there is a better way to train than what is sort of popular or what most people are doing. It's crap. You don't, you, right. you can do better basically. Right. Um, and, and so what's funny about that is I knew th there are a couple travel ball organizations that have looked at even just like testing medicine ball throws and they're like, huh, that's really cool. We're going to start doing that with, with all our teams. Thank God you're actually trying to do right. something better. Right. So that's, so that's always been like my MO, I guess. But as far as like creating more business, it's interesting because I try to keep it as small as possible. Like I don't mm. want more athletes. I don't want a hundred kids walking through my gym as, mm. as maddening as that might sound to the most coaches who would buy a Proteus and like, Oh my God, how am I going to pay for this thing? Mm -hmm. um, it, from a business perspective, most of my clients are like a, a very in person and, and, and we are very much working together on everything. Um, so I want to make sure they make progress, but the way that, I think I've sort of branched out lately and this has been a huge part because of the Proteus. Um, the way that I've been branching out is through doing more assessment style um, and, and really like assessment specific programming. So hmm. oh, by, by that, I mean like, okay, you come in and you get assessed on the Proteus, you come through, whether it's a camp of like six kids at a time, or you're just coming in through an individual assessment, you come in on the Proteus and you get all these things tested. You could test so much. And, and we're testing probably five, six different exercises at a bunch of different loads. And now we have all this stuff laid out for you. I write you a program based off of that. And I want you to come back in a month or two weeks or something like that. And we want you to make sure that you keep improving. Mm. And so that's kind of lessened the workload for me. But now I'm getting 10, 15 extra kids 
that I don't have to throw batting practice to. Right. But the, the Proteus helps me do that because I can get these assessments done. I can get a camp of kids all done in a half hour. So and, you're doing that. So just to kind of, uh, for my clarification, they're coming in getting tested. You're writing their, you know, you're seeing the, the data, you're writing their program, but they're doing it somewhere else. They're not doing it at your facility. So it's like an extra mm-hmm. Uh, you know, source of income for you and extra, an extra way for you to kind of, uh, you know, they, they always use the buzzword scale, but scale mm-hmm. scale out your business, right? And then they come yep. back in, they retest, you see how they've progressed, you change up their program. Bingo. It, it, it's, yeah, multiple streams of revenue. In my opinion, it's the biggest, the, the, the biggest key to being successful in this industry, man. It's like, mm-hmm. you, you, you know, like I have my clients that, I make okay money off of like good enough to get by for sure. Mm-hmm. But you know, that ultimately like you want to thrive in this industry. You don't want to just survive. So that's, that's kind of where this piece has really come in. And um, yeah, it's, it's been absolutely huge for, for us for sure. That's awesome. That's awesome to hear. And, and what, so I guess a, a question would be, let's, let's talk about like a, a general typical client you're going to serve. Maybe let's talk about the ones that are coming into your facility uh, I think it's always good to kind of describe, you know, you don't have to give away your secret sauce. So d- definitely <laughs> don't do that. But tell me kind of the process. Do they come in, they get those assessments you talked about, and then how frequently are they coming in to see you and train, you know, and then I think maybe as a follow up to that, how frequently are you retesting them? And I'm sure there's some variation, but just a g- your typical client. Let's just talk about that. Yeah. So like of uh, the guys that I train in person, I think almost all of them come in about four times a week. Some of them come in a fifth day. Mm-hmm. And so what their day looks like is pretty much you come in and everybody has their own thing. Now that I've, I've started to notice that when they, they'll go through their warm up, and I'm very like hands off with their warm up process. A lot of them, like they, they don't all have to do the same thing. Some of them are quicker, some of them are, take more time. That's fine. Mm-hmm. But one thing I do try to have them all do is test something high speed to test for fatigue readiness and just general, like, how is your body functioning that day? Like, are you fatigued? Are you ready to go mm-hmm. before we get in the cages? So the Proteus is great for that because you could put it on freestyle mode you know, pick whatever movement you want to do, go ahead. And we know what numbers you need to hit. When you hit those numbers, boom, we go to the cages. So the Proteus, I would say most of them like to do either like a shot put. Some of them just like to do like a punch in a row. Um, Got it. That, and, and, but some of them like to do the med balls. Some of them actually like to run a sprint or something. I'm, you know, whatever you want to do, we just got to test something. And um, if it's working for you, then we keep it going. And so then After that, we go to the cages and you're either throwing or swinging that day. Obviously, if you're a pitcher, we're going to go through a bullpen or some, you know, whatever's on your throwing program for the day. And with our hitting, I'll either get up on the mound and I'll throw live at bats. I do that a ton. And if, if I'm not doing like a short, like 40 foot live at bat, 45 feet, it's hard, you know, whatever I can throw that day. Um, We'll get on the machine and we'll crank that thing up and we'll have it go super fast. We usually have like the rap Soto out or something testing their exit velocities and their, you know, blast motion, bat speed, stuff like that. So we measure that and we see how we're doing. And a lot of guys simply by just competing in the Proteus, a sprint and uh-huh. their, their, you know, cage numbers, numbers go through the roof. Huge, and it's huge, just, huge. Yeah. So you create that competitive environment and it just gets each, both of them trying, everyone trying to level up. Right, exactly. Right from the start, they're competing like, pretty much the moment that they're done with their initial warm up, it's, it's go time. And, and so everybody has kind of like a group of like four or five guys that they've been hitting with for a while. And that's kind of been like their competition group. Like it's just sort of formed itself. Like I've never told, um, I've never told the kids who they need to train with. They just kind of do it. And that's been cool to see too. But um, yeah, I mean, there's a group of kids just the other day I saw, uh, I think in the all four kids, I think they all PR'd. One of them had 112, one had 111, one had a 108. And the other kid who's never actually hit over 100 before hit over 100 exit below, I think like six or seven times in the session. It was nuts. That's amazing. But that's, yeah, that's what you'd want to see at the end of the summer. Like kids are about to go back to college and they're hitting some big numbers. So, right. Um, but well, yeah, so then after the cages and everything like that, 
we'll have more of a traditional lift or something, but um, we might even have like some more Proteus stuff in there. Like on an upper mm. body session, we'll go like an explosive press and that'll be part of their workout. And then they'll go from like an explosive press over to like a heavy press, like a heavy mm. landmine or a heavy pin press, go back and forth between those two and kind of use that feedback and say, okay, we're doing sets of three on each exercise. If your numbers start to drop off, then we're shutting you down. So you might get four sets, you might get six sets, who knows, but your numbers will tell us how you're doing. You and doing? The, mo the moment that you stop progressing or the moment it starts declining, usually even by like five or 10%, it's time to shut it. But um, I think that concept is something that's really been a separator for a lot of guys too, is like, you know, they made the gains as a 15 and 16 year old, just lifting heavy weight. Mm -hmm. And now like to make those power gains, you really need as many great reps, like great being quality both, reps. Yeah. Quality reps. Yeah. Yeah. And, and quality is obviously like, you know, it's technique and stuff, but it's also speed or power within the movement. If it's not as powerful or as fast as you can do it, it's probably not going to be good enough to produce an adaptation anyway. So why even screw around with it? Right. So yeah, that's, that's how we approach a lot of things like a press, a row, things like that. We, we will pair it with something on the Proteus or we've been doing a pullover exercise on the Proteus as well. Guys love that one. Oh, um, okay. It's really cool. I like that that's one cool. a lot, but um, yeah, so it, 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 we'll do that. And then, uh, you know, usually we'll finish up with like arm care exercises, a slow eccentric work with the rear shoulders, stuff like that. And then, yeah, that's like a pretty, you know, basic day that we go through. And, wow. you know, if you add up, I don't know, 50, 60, 70 of those in a, in a summer, uh, you know, over the course of the summer, you're probably going to see some good numbers. So, yeah, no kidding. So, so are you, are you, so it's, it's really good to hear that. So you're still you doing, uh, you know, your regular weightlifting, you're still throwing that in there. Um, but kind of the sounds like the main way you're structuring it, if I could simplify is you're using some testing, whether it be Proteus or some other devices, just to assess readiness, see where they're at that day, kind of look at, look at it. Okay. Are they, do they need more time to warm up or is this not going to be a big day for that person? Right. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you're going to do some other things that just work on, you know, uh, basically high activation, right. Yep. Try to get a lot of, you know, power and activation, but you'll mix that in with some more traditional strength training, or are mm -hmm. you doing the strength training afterwards like which is is it kind of just mixed in or what it's it's kind of both like some okay. guys some guys absolutely love going from like literally like like a french contrast going from a yeah. fast thing to a heavy thing some guys love it some guys don't and so that's fine mm -hmm. but you they're all still doing their fast high speed work like it's just sometimes it's separate it's it's all based on what they like really but yeah um you know that's that's kind of how this goes some totally. some guys yeah, some guys respond well to it, but yeah, I think that one of the big things that I've really started to notice, and it's funny, like we were talking off air um, about Jim Tomey. So mm -hmm. Jim Tomey, right before like I got cool. on air, he was he was on the Proteus, on our Proteus today, Sick. like, and he was smashing it around and he was, <laughs> he, he was having a blast with it. But so he even said the exact same thing. He said, what we were talking about is like, as a baseball player, we work with a two pound bat and we work with a five ounce ball. That that's what you have. That, that's we, we can't change that. We can't mm -hmm. swing a 10 pound bat. We can't get good at, you know, anything else, but a five ounce baseball and swinging a two pound bat. So when you think about like the confines of strength training, almost everything that we do is going to be heavy compared to that. It's so hard to work on the velocity end of things because everything is so far removed in the weight room, at least from the velocity component on the baseball field. Now, I think what a lot of people argue against me is that they say, well, why not just lift heavy weights and then let the field stuff take care of itself. And that can work no doubt. But I think one of the problems that you run into is if you're just swinging like crazy in the batting cages, it's really tough to hit. And, mm -hmm. you know, try hitting 95 miles per hour with your just crazy caveman as fast as you can swing. It's really hard to do it. So 
your brain and your central nervous system, the governor gets put on it. So mm -hmm. now you're swinging a little slower just to make contact. Now it's no longer good enough to produce that adaptations of swinging faster. Or if you're trying to throw as hard as you can, you're probably not going to hit your target. It's mm -hmm. okay. Like I'm fine with it, but mm -hmm. understand that your coach is going to probably take you out of the game because you can't throw a strike. And so the, like what I like to tell people is we're using the Proteus, we're using medicine balls, we're using sprints, we're using these other things to make us more explosive as like a, a, as a, as a system, as a whole. And now when I swing or throw or whatever I do, it's natural. It's the way I feel comfortable and it's going to be elevated because I've done all this other stuff to make me more explosive and more powerful. Yeah. So that's, that's my I, take. I No, I love it. And the other thing that I think people that would maybe argue against you are missing is that power and strength is plain specific, right? So, you know, I think this has been shown time and time again. Uh, the last thing I want is a, a power lifter to come in and swing a baseball uh, bat and think he's mm -hmm. going to be the fastest guy. I mean, it's just, if all you're doing is chaining in the sagittal plane and you're mm -hmm. never doing anything to translate it into this other plane, it, it, there's a reason those guys, you watch those guys swing a golf club or, or anything like that, it, they don't move well, right? And you can actually get to the point where, I know this has been shown in lots of places, you keep uh, training too much strength, uh, you actually get morphological changes in the spine that actually prevent you from being able to rotate. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, you know, we have to, you know, whatever you're using, you definitely need to start developing those motor patterns, developing strength, uh, developing power in the, you know, planes of motion that are applied in the sport. You know, like you, you, you said, it's not simulating the sport, right? Like we're not, we're not going out there saying that doing a uh, trunk rotation on Proteus is the same as swinging a baseball bat because right, they're inherently different but you are at least loading the body in a way that teaches you how to translate all that muscle mass you gained lifting weights into something rotational. And then you're quantifying it, you're gamifying it. And you're also, you know, helping them learn how to translate power from the ground into this, uh, you know, at their feet into rotational movement at their hands. I mean, there's been so much, uh, you know, research done to look at, you know, how much it really does matter when you look at training on things being in the same plane and actually gaining uh, strength and power and speed in those planes. So keeping it to that is key. And, you, and you're just doing that. What I love about your system is you're just doing that in so many different ways, right? And you're meeting the athlete where they are and you're saying, okay, let's, let's get what you need in the directions you need it. And let's find what works for you. And I love how you're just able to mix things around because everyone's different, motivated by different things. Oh yeah. And so on top of that, like I agree 100% with everything you just said, but on that topic of power, like now you start to dive into it even deeper and you say, well, power is fairly velocity specific as well. Like, yeah. so you need that velocity component. And if all you ever do is train with a heavy load, you're really going to miss out. And I think a lot of times people will look at something fast, like like a Proteus shot put throw with say 15 pounds. It's a pretty dang fast movement. Mm -hmm. Like, and they're like, well, maybe, maybe for some, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Maybe not for me, maybe for you, yeah. <laughs> but, but okay. So they see yeah. that and they're like, oh, well, it's like so fast. Like, is it really doing anything for you? And it's like, yes, it is because you see the number is improving. So there's some adaptation happening there. And if, okay, if we're loading this press, the shot put throw, whatever, and it's heavier than a baseball, so we should be improving the force output at higher speeds because right. it's heavier than a baseball anyways. So it's like, yes, a bench press might help you, but I would argue that a, a, a faster pressing action would be even more beneficial because you're also getting that higher velocity component. Like it 100% matters. And if you don't believe me, look at any research paper because it will come yeah. up time and time again that totally. sprinters, jumpers, the, the ones who have those fast twitch type two X fibers, the ones that are producing forces at high speeds, all that stuff is, it's all been written time and time again. And you, right. you shouldn't ignore it for a high speed sport like baseball. Yeah, totally. And, and I, I love it. And I think the thing that people always have to remember is that, you know, power, uh, which is ultimately what determines success in almost every sport, right? How much power you produce, which is just a function of force times velocity. And if people are only working on the force side of the equation, 
and never working on the velocity side, they're missing half the equation. And now you just got to add in uh, the other thing about velocity is technically velocity is direction specific, specific, mm -hmm. it's vector specific, right? So right. Um, otherwise you're just talking about speed, you know, speed and velocity are kind of even in the physics terms are technically different. So when it comes to power, you really have to uh, work on developing, as you said, that full continuum, right? It's great to have, you, everyone needs baseline strength. Force production is the essential basic component foundation for, for athletes in almost every sport, particular power-based sports like baseball. But then you have to really load that velocity por uh, portion through the entire speed, strength, strength, speed spectrum to yeah. really, really get the full benefits. Yeah, I, I think where this gets a little confused on Twitter is people think force is only done with a heavy load. Mm. Force, force can be improved with a heavy load, but it can also be improved with a light load. If I'm more mm. forceful with five pounds in my hand, well, guess what? My power number will go up on mm -hmm. the Proteus or with this five pound med ball, whatever. So yes, I would argue that maybe if you have a 15 year old string bean throwing med balls all day, won't get them jacked. Yeah. But, but if you have somebody with adequate, you know, musculature and things like that, you can improve force in, as you said, different planes, different mm -hmm. loads, improving force is just output that's what it is right so it, it it can be and it should be improved force at higher velocities that's right. the, the, a simpler way to think about it and here's one other physics way that we can think about this too that i think is helpful is that uh force right which is like as you said it, it is something that you can produce at lower resistances you think about throwing uh let's say a five pound med ball or something like that you actually technically produce more force than the ball weighs to physically get it to accelerate, right? And that's actually one of the reasons we've seen for our metrics, acceleration actually ends up being uh, maybe even a greater indicator of uh, correlation to sports performance, even than power is because if you're, per, if you're making this thing accelerate faster, you have to create more starting force to make it get going and accelerate. So it, you are producing force uh, greater than that five pounds, right? Right. That's just a physics thing, right? You, uh, but it's that acceleration and continuing that acceleration all the way through the movement that really yields those high velocities. Uh, and something you know, especially Proteus is really good at. It loads its you know momentum minimized. It loads you all the way through to yeah. in. So it, it makes the the user keep pushing all the way through. Um, so, so yeah, I'm, I'm totally with you, man. That's a really good point about, you know, and something I think should be out there more, uh, we'll make, we'll make sure your name is tied to it, is that force is you could build force even at lighter resistances. Right. Mm -hmm. So I love it. So I, so I guess, uh, you know, a couple other questions here and I don't want to make this a, a, lo a long episode. You've already done such a really, I think illuminate a lot of great things for, for, for people. Um, you know, I guess something I'd like to know is you mentioned the gamification. Uh, is is that the primary thing that athletes like using Proteus for? Is just seeing those numbers compete against each other? Are there any other, you know, kind of reasons that they get attracted to it that they find themselves wanting to train on it, or is it mainly those numbers and you know looking at how things compare? I would say for the most part, it's the competition aspect. Like that's. Yeah like especially the high school and college kids, like they just want to keep bang, get those numbers better. Hey, I got 500 on this and you got 480. You suck. Like that's just kind of how this goes. Um, nice. But I would say at the higher, higher levels, like, like a pro level guy the what I noticed they all were really interested in was like the 3d arc of the movement. Uh -huh. And, mm -hmm. and they were like, man, when I do this shot put throw, I'm like, blue and green and then i'm getting red out here and that's okay like i think we, we've talked about that before that you're always going to produce more force at the end of a movement but what what i was talking with them about was we want to get like that it with that 3d arc we want to start getting like the orange and the yellow closer to the start and so if you've never seen the proteus before you you like it's it starts out slow with with every movement it's like blue and green and then red hot is where you're getting your fastest or your highest peak power numbers. So we want to get that peak power closer 
to the start of the movement. And that's something that all the pro hitters were big on is like, they always want to look at the 3d and, and just kind of like, you know, sort of see where they're at. Yeah. 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 I could see that's definitely something that, uh, I think people that really know their body and know their movement and are, have more experience are drawn more to, you show that to some people who are newer produce is like, what does that mean? You know what I mean? <laughs> but, yeah, exactly. But it is, it's something we've had in the system for a long, long time. And, you know, you know, and we produce that for every single movement, but some people just don't really, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Just don't really care or, or don't really get a lot out of it. I think it applies a really a lot more towards, rotational athletes than probably mm-hmm. a lot of other movements. Uh, so yeah, that's, that's super interesting. Um, well, uh, a couple other questions here before we kind of wrap up. Um, do you, I, I'm kind of curious because when we work with a lot of customers who are interested in getting Proteus and they want to kind of know how do they, what other pieces of technology and equipment that they pair, that do you pair with it? Right. And so I've heard you mention a few things, uh, you know, obviously you have, you know, a, a traditional weight room set up. Um, uh, you obviously have med balls. You said you're at, have a cage. Uh, and then you mentioned wrap soda or there and, and, and radar guns. Are there any other piece of technology that you uh, have or are, are interested in getting that uh, you think you'll pair with all these other devices and with Proteus? Yeah. The, the one that we use a ton is the bar speed sensor as well. Mm. Um, I'm, I'm big on bar speed, like velocity based training. I think it's right up my alley. Sure. <laughs> um, and, and yeah, so that, that works really, really well, especially with, um, a lot of those, like the lower body strength movements, I've started to get away from mm. thinking about one rep maxes so much with the lower body. And I've been thinking a lot more about, okay, let's say you can reverse lunge 225 pounds at 0.5 meters per second. I want that to get to 0.7 meters per second by the end of off season. So rather than saying you got to reverse lunge 450 pounds to make progress, no, you can take the same weight that you know you can handle and we're going to move it faster. And so that's just kind of right up the same alley. But yeah, that's what I would say. Um, you know, the, the, there's some really cool sprint timers out there that I've looked into. I'm still using a stopwatch. Um, but I, I've used some, like I used a cheaper one in the past and it was just a pain to set up. And like, if we did it outdoors, they would like blow the tripod, like the wind would blow the tripod over. It was stupid, but, um, yeah, I would say that would be a cool one to look into as well. Cause sprinting, I think is, uh, probably another very underutilized, like sprinting with full recovery is a very underutilized thing in the baseball training world. Whereas they always want to chase the squat and reverse lunge one rep max. And it's just like, mm-hmm. nah, man, that, that ain't it. Like there's, there's a lot more that you could be doing with, uh, with your lower body training and stuff like that. But yeah, that's, that's what I would say is other pieces of equipment that I use. Cool. Cool. Love it. Well, I think, uh, I think it's time to jump into, uh, our high velocity questions. You know, I, I don't want to call it the lightning round or the rapid fire. <laughs> We're going to call it high velocity questions for this one. Uh, yeah, there we go, baby. Uh, okay. So, uh, just off the cuff, give me your answers, whatever you think. So, uh, what we'll start with question one, what is the biggest gimmick that you've seen in the training world in the last few years? Med ball throws at low effort. Stupid. Hate it. Okay. Interesting. Great. Great one. Um, And what piece of equipment that you didn't just mention, do you wish you had that you don't now? Force plate. Force plate. Love it. Some people call Proteus the force plate of rotation. Just Yeah. (laughs) I think a force, a force plate would be good for like baseball, like like in in the cages and stuff. Yeah. Totally. Force plates are awesome. Um, okay. What are your top five favorite exercises? Proteus or not? They don't have to be Proteus. What are your top five go-to favorite exercises? Okay. Sprint, Proteus pullover, Proteus shot put, med ball, step overhead throw. And then if I had to go with a number five, that's a tough one. I'm going to probably say Proteus like trunk rotation. Like the oh, straight arm trunk rotation. Awesome, man. Awesome. So those are all awesome. Great exercises. What is your favorite athlete? Who is your favorite athlete and why? Shit. That's a tough one. <laughs> that's a tough one. That's a tough one. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to say Mike Talkman. Oh, okay. <laughs> but but I, I hope 
Jack Sawinski and Ryan Fitzgerald aren't listening as well. So, <laughs> all right, man. All right. Uh, and, and, and <laughs> so what would you give me this? What advice would you give to younger Bill Miller? Train fast. Just do it. Like yeah. it, it's, it's not soft. It's not, uh, it, it's, you know, it's not going to make you a wimp if you took yeah. a day off from weightlifting to go run sprints and stuff like yeah. that. I got it. And actually I just realized something you mentioned, I want to revisit this. Who is your favorite athlete of all time? How about that? Of all time, Oof. man, I don't know. <laughs> uh, I guess Brian Urlacher, Chicago guy. Ooh, yeah. yeah. Love Urlacher, man. Uh, all right. Great. And a uh, last one. What other podcasts do you listen to? What's your favorite podcast? You know, Jerry DiFilippo actually has a good one. And I know he doesn't have a Proteus yet, but I think he, he's, he's going to go down that route. But yeah, Challenger Strength, he, he's got a lot of good, good guests on. Awesome. Awesome. Well, Bill, thanks so much, man. How, how can people find out about you? Uh, you know, where can they find out about everything that you do? Where can they buy your books? Uh, tell us how we find out, uh, you know, all the cool things that you're up to on Instagram, um, Bill Miller training and on Twitter, I'm at Bill Mills. Uh, it's pretty easy to find me. I, I, I always answer DMS and stuff like that for anybody who's asking training related questions. And, uh, uh my books are throw fast and swing fast. You can buy swing fast on Amazon throw fast is on a different website, but you can find links to that in my bio on Instagram. And yeah, any questions or anything about training, I'm always down to talk with people. I have zero ego, like whatsoever. Like I think there's a lot of people that are very uh, high and mighty on themselves about training. And it's like, man, I've changed my tune on training over the past five years. And I don't know how much I'm going to change over the next five years, but I'm probably going to continue to grow and change and stuff like that. That's just how this stuff goes, man. So, I love yeah. it, man. I love it. Well, Bill, I've always enjoyed talking to you. Thanks for being a guest on the podcast. And uh, we look forward to following what you're doing and, and seeing how those next five years go. <laughs> right on. All right. Thanks so much, man. Everybody, talk to you later.